right we now. We are filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archives. We have with us today one of the American icons in jazz, Herbie Hancock. <laughs> Hi there, Mike. Great, great. Right. I want to uh, just uh, kind of let op say a few little things, a uh, few little questions, and just kind of let you roll on. You were a prodigy. <laughs> That's a funny word. Um, I'm starting to hear people use that more and more now uh, in uh, reference to me in my early life and in, uh, in music. But I mean, I never. I mean, I think that way about some other people, but never about myself, you know. I just uh, do what I do. Um, I started when I was seven, but, you know, I think that's, I don't know if that's an average age. It may be an average age. It's probably close to average for starting to, to learn to play an instrument. Uh, I've heard of people starting to play instruments as early as three, you know. Um, well, now I guess with the Suzuki method and some other <laughs> methods, they started one. Or they, you know, when they come out of the room, they're starting. You know? <laughs> but um, um, anyway, um, I seemed to be able to catch on to reading fairly quickly when I was young. Um, my first teacher, which uh, her name was Mrs. Whalem, and she taught me for two and a half years. She was the church organist for the Baptist Church, and I took lessons at the second floor of the Baptist Church, you know, and that was the church I belonged to at that time. Um, anyway, she didn't teach me very much about dynamics. You know? uh -huh. So I could only play uh, one volume level, <laughs> and that was fairly loud, you know, but I didn't know anything about playing soft, nothing about touch, nothing about nuances. Uh -huh. And, and uh, um, nothing about the history of music. I just learned to, to read what the notes were. You know? uh -huh. um, and then I got a new teacher, Mrs. Jordan. And I remember sort of, it's not exactly auditioning f for her, but um, she wanted to hear, you know, hear me play something so she could tell what level I was at. You know? uh -huh. And, um, she said, ah, yeah, you read very well, you know. And but she said, um, but did she teach you anything about, about dynamics? You know, I said, what? <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, loud and soft. Anyway, then she played some Chopin. And my eyes bugged out. I said, how do you do that? I want, I want to play like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> because she, it was so beautiful the way she was playing. I mean, it, it was, you know, she had the dynamics and it was colorful and it, it, it had shape to it. It wasn't just plink, 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 plink. You know, that's what I was playing before. Plink, 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 plink. That's all there was. So anyway. something had to mesmerize you to draw you into that next level. Yeah, it was the feeling. That's, that's what did it, the feeling. Now, uh, tell us about your debut with the symphony. Well, uh, that was during the time that I was with Mrs. Jordan, the second teacher. You know, by that time, you know, I was playing uh, Bach, uh, Inventions, and some fugues and preludes, and some uh, Chopin. I'd gotten into etudes and and uh, um, I think maybe Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu, some things like that. Um, so, um, 1950, yeah, actually 1950, is, is that right? No, 1951, I auditioned for, the, for this, um, uh, basically it was a concert, the Young People's Concert Series in Chicago. And, um, what would happen is that the... Um, uh, you would audition for who was then the assistant conductor of um, the Chicago Symphony. Uh, and that was uh, George Schick, who became president of Manhattan School of Music later on, by the way. And uh, anyway, um, so they would select one person 
from each uh, instrument of the orchestra who would be a winner, and I happened to win for the piano. And the prize would be to play your concerto with the Chicago Symphony. Um, anyway, I won. <laughs> uh, and then, um, well, it, the way I found out that I won was that I received a postcard in the mail about two months later. It said, congratulations, you've been selected as the piano winner of the Young People's Concert Series. However, uh, oh, by the way, it, it said the date you will, you are to perform is February fifth, nineteen fifty-two. I think that was it. Yeah, or nineteen fifty-one. I've forgotten. Yeah, maybe I maybe I auditioned in fifty and played in fifty-one. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so uh, um, anyway, it, it it said. However. The concerto that you auditioned with, somehow we haven't been able to locate the orchestral parts. So uh, you'll either have to learn a new concerto or forfeit the performance. You'll still be a winner, but you won't be able to play with the Chicago Symphony. So I had to learn a new concerto, you know. And that other one I knew cold. The new one I had to learn in about three months, so I didn't have nearly as much time. And. Um, so I made the performance, and as a matter of fact, after the performance, I f signed the first autograph that I ever signed, you know. Uh, and, uh, but um, the next week, oh, I should say that the performance was at the, Chica at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, you know. And um, the next week, I, uh, my, my teacher had gotten herself and me tickets to to see Myra Hess, who was a very famous classical pianist at the time, who was performing with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. So we went that week to see Myra Hess. Guess what she played? The concerto that I auditioned with. <laughs> so all of that uh, nonsense that they sent about them not being being able to find the parts was a Bunch of baloney. Hello. You know. <laughs> Let me ask anyway, you. My uh, teacher was mad. Oh, I thought she was gonna tear that place up. She was so mad. I mean, I mean, she said, I mean, how could they do that to a little kid? You know. When did you uh, get started moving into jazz? When did you make the transition? And and what was the catalyst for the transition? Um. It was about. Um, 1953 or 54, when I, I was um, either 13 or 14 years old. Um, <laughs> the, the funny thing is that I had been listening to rhythm and blues before that, you know, and uh, you know, hanging out with the kids my age, of course, and that's what they listened to. That's what I listened to. And I also listened to classical music, too. Cause my mother wanted to give me, uh, uh, quote, culture. She wanted to make sure her, her children were, quote, cultured. And what that meant was really European culture, you know. Um, um, and what it, what it certainly did was give me a pretty well-rounded cultural foundation, you know. So I'm happy about the way things really turned out. Because huh. I can use all of that in playing jazz, and then it also gives me the avenue of being involved with, with classical music, you know, if the, if the desire is there and the opportunity arises. Um, so I've got a whole spectrum of things that are, are part of my foundation. Anyway, um, 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 my mother was a very important, probably the most important uh, influence on me as far as um, not only support, but uh, being able to push me, move me forward. Because I had a tendency to kind of lay back and be a little shy, you know, and she would just push me on out there. You know, I'm glad she did, you know. Um, anyway, um, I noticed in high school that the, the kids that were 
most mature acting and the coolest and the most mysterious were the ones that listened to jazz. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I said, I want to be like that. You know, so I started hanging out with them. You hang out with them, they're listening to jazz, you know? So um, that was one of the things. That was one of the things. Uh, there was another very important thing, too. There was a pianist named Don Goldberg uh, who performed at the um, variety show that my school used to give every semester. Um, and he had a jazz trio. And he was my age, he was in my class, and I heard him improvising. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked, first of all. It sounded, I didn't know what he was doing. Because I, I always used to turn jazz off whenever it was on the radio. Because I didn't understand it, and I didn't want to know anything about it, I didn't care about it, I didn't like it. But when I saw this guy improvising, you know, and it sounded organized to me. I didn't know what he was doing, but it sounded like he knew what he was doing. Uh -huh. Then I became fascinated. Uh -huh. Because he was doing it on my instrument, and he was my age. Uh -huh. I, thought, I thought you had to be much older to play jazz, you know, like you know, 19 or something. <laughs> and, uh, but he was doing it, and so I started hanging out with this guy and asking him, you know, what does he listen to? How does he learn that? How do you do these things? And so at the time, his um, favorite pianist and the person he tried to emulate was uh, George Shearing. And uh, so I, I remember going home telling my mother, Mama, you got to give me some George Shearing records. And she said, son, you have some George Shearing records. I said, no, Mom, you don't understand. I want to get some George Shearing records. I got to find out how to do this, this stuff, improvising, you know? She said, Herbie, remember those records I bought for you about two years ago? And you got angry with me because you didn't know what, who it was, and, and that was some other records you wanted, and you, you, you had a tantrum, <laughs> and I bought you these records for Christmas? I said, yeah. She said, that was George Shearing, and you've got those records in your cabinet. Mm. And I went in the cabinet, sure enough, they were there. You know, my mother had no idea that that was going to be the first jazz artist that I would ask about. You know, it just was. Um, let, let me make a quantum there because I want to. I want to hook in on something that you said. Mm -hmm. You said the kids that you were hanging out with, who were the hippest, the most mature, and the most mysterious. Mm -hmm. That's what turned you on. Mm -hmm. So now, from your entrance into jazz, to the place where you would be asked to play keyboard with the hippest, most mysterious <laughs> man in all of jazz. You know we're talking about Miles. Yeah. <laughs> Talk, tell us about how, how, Miles, how you got to work with Miles and how that, that liaison came about and some of the dynamics in there. OK. Um, I was brought to New York from Chicago by Donald Byrd, you know, another uh, great uh, trumpeter. Um, and Donald really took me under his wing and uh, we shared an apartment together, so he was my roommate. And he was like really a big brother to me. And uh, he really showed me the ropes in New York. And he, he um, really encouraged me in so, so many ways and taught me a lot of things. And, and was the person responsible for me doing my very first record as a leader. He's responsible for me getting my own publishing company so that my first tunes were published in my my own company and not in the record company's company. Thank goodness for that, because one of the first tunes I wrote uh, was Watermelon Man. You Which know. you still play today. I still play today. And he was also responsible for introducing me to Miles Davis. So I owe a lot to Donald Byrd. I mean, I, I, so much that I, you know, I could never repay him for what he's done for me. And, and uh, somebody has to get, give you that hand, don't they? Somebody. Sometimes not. Sometimes, well, uh, there's always some kind of opportunity, one way or the other. Whether it's someone actually taking you somewhere, uh, or whether a door being open where something is needed, and you happen to be at the right place at the right time. Um, 
Uh, but in, in very, very many cases, maybe most cases, there is a, a person that gives you a chance somehow. Sometimes it's a person that gives you inspiration. You mm -hmm. never know. Um, that's why, um, by the way, um, it's so important to not think of our lives as being trivial and not think of our daily life. Just because we don't have anything doesn't mean that we can't be a great influence on someone who could have a, a dynamic influence on the rest of humanity. That is an awesome statement. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation within itself. Yes, yeah, so everybody's oh, important. I'm, I'm going to put that one on hold. We're okay. going to come back to that. Jump on Miles. miles and okay. I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep that reserved. We're going we're gonna to finish with that because okay. that's, that's a mouthful. Okay. So um, uh, Donald had introduced me to Miles in, uh, about a year and a half or two years prior to my joining Miles' band. But um, uh, the way I actually got into Miles' band, I had been hearing rumors that Miles was looking for me. And finally, um, I had started hearing so many rumors that I began to believe it. Because, I mean, at first I said, hmm, come on, get out of here. Miles Davis calling me. <laughs> no, forget it. <laughs> you know, that'll never happen. And uh, I mean, I had never even dreamed of playing with Miles. That was beyond my fondest dreams. And um, anyway, so Donald Byrd, again, because he was my roommate, said, if Miles calls you, tell him you're not working with anybody. I said, but Donald, I owe you so much. He said, shut up, man. <laughs> He's, he said, I would never stand in the way of you having such a, a great opportunity like that. He says, tell him you're not working with anybody. And it was almost within about an hour the phone mm. rang, and it was Miles. Mm. First question Miles asked was, are you working with anybody? <laughs> and I, I looked at Donald, and I said, no. <laughs> and then he, he invited me to his house the next day at 2.30, I think it was. Click. And he hung up the phone. I didn't know his phone number. You know, fortunately, I knew Donald Byrd knew where he lived, but I started to panic. And then a half hour later, Tony Williams, a uh, great drummer, called me. And uh, it turned out that Miles had called him, too. And he had Miles' address and everything. So the next day, we went to Miles' place, and uh, Miles um, ushered us into his basement, his rec room there. And um, Ron Carter, uh, bassist, was there. And George Coleman, tenor saxophonist, he was there. And Tony Williams and myself. And, uh, and Miles. And Miles didn't pick up his horn. He, he just, he said, play somebody. He asked, I think, Ron to kind of lead this, what I thought was audition. And he says, have, uh, she play some of these tunes. There were some new tunes they were working on, I guess. And, uh, and then Miles split. He went upstairs somewhere. And um, so we started playing these tunes. They had music there. This went on for three days. Mm. And I saw Miles maybe twice in those three days. And, and once um, Gil Evans and Philly Joe Jones came down. Gil Evans, uh, who did these incredible arrangements of Porgy and Bess and um, uh, 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 Sketches of Spain, Sketches of Spain yeah. Miles Ahead, a bunch of things. Anyway. Um, and Philly Joe Jones, who was um, Miles' former drummer, uh, they came down. And by the way, I found out much later that Miles was upstairs in one of his other rooms listening to us play over the intercom. Mm. So I think he suspected that if he had been there, we would have felt intimidated. So he wasn't there. He was away, and we didn't even know he was there. So he could really hear what we could do. Anyway, after the, the, uh, the third day, he came downstairs and he said, uh, okay, tomorrow we meet at uh, 3.30 at Columbia Studios on 30th Street. And that was a very famous recording studio. I knew that studio, but I'd never recorded there. And I said, I was just shocked. And I said, Miles, does, does that mean I'm in the band? He said, you're making the record. <laughs> you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> and then he smiled, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, the one statement he made that gave me the most indication that he liked what was going on, because he hadn't said anything yet. Mm -hmm. Nothing complimentary, nothing. At the studio, we walked in there, and then Tio Macero, who was the, the producer, uh, came into the booth, the recording booth, and Miles said, hey, Tio, listen to this. And I could tell by Miles' face, he was, he was just chomping at the bit to show Tio his new band. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we kicked off some one of the tunes. I think it was Seven Steps to Heaven, you know. And Tio almost fell off his chair. He couldn't believe it. And because uh, it was a very exciting uh, group, you know. And Tony at the time was 17 years old. So he was a uh, talking about a prodigy. That's the prodigy. And uh, he was a real phenomenon. And uh, we played there, and then we recorded the album Seven Steps to Heaven. And the following week, we played our first gig up at Bowdoin College in uh, Maine. And I, then I was I, there for five and a half years after that. Wow. I want to I wanna contrast <coughs> Excuse me. something just to uh, and have you talk about the experience. The experience of being ushered into the basement that first day, and then the experience of being the one chosen. I saw the ceremony to give Miles the Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm. I saw that. I was touched by that. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, um, by the time I was able to give Miles the Lifetime Achievement Award from, uh, I guess that was from NARIS, from the Grammy Awards, uh, part of the Grammy Awards uh, ceremony. Um, NARIS is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. It's the Academy Award for the record industry. Anyway. Um, by that time, I had my own career going. Uh, I had even um, done some acting on television. Uh, I think I had already had a TV show called Rock School at the time, which came and it did. We did a couple seasons of that, and and uh, then that went. And there was another show I had too, called Coast to Coast. It was on Showtime. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was before uh, presenting this award to Miles or not, but anyway, I'm just saying that by by then I'd kind of grown up and had my own own things going, and and um, had been a presenter several times also for the, for the Grammys, and so the, I was selected by uh, Mike Green, who's the president of of Naris and um, I think he was president at that time. Um, and maybe there was a committee, but I was asked to, to do that, probably because I had been a former member of Miles' band. And they could trust that I, I knew how to deliver that. You know? <laughs> uh -huh. you know? it, was a, it was a touching moment. And not much was said, but there was some electricity there. Well, mm -hmm. I know what Miles means to me personally. And, and I know what he means to music and what he means to the public at, at large. And, and so in, in giving this lifetime achievement to, to Miles, um, I wasn't just reading what was on the teleprompter. I mean, I was reading that, but I meant every word that I said. Because mm -hmm. you know, I had something to, of my own experience with this man who was like my teacher, like my father in a way, you know, um, as far as my career is concerned. You know. I learned so much from Miles that um, uh, I would be a very different piano player had it not been for that experience in playing with that particular Miles Davis group, you know, because of Miles and because of all the side men. But um, one of the things that Miles um, provided am among many things is the attitude to really encourage an individual to to develop his creativity you know and mm -hmm. 
He was very concerned about about young people. He hired a very young band, mm -hmm. and he wanted us to figure things out ourselves. Um, he wanted us to to c continually work on things. I mean, he even said, "I pay you to practice." on the bandstand, on the stage, in front of the people, not just in your room. You know, the idea was not just to go to your room and practice something and learn it perfectly and then play it in front of the people. Miles wanted true jazz improvisation uh, to be presented by this band, which means you capture that moment, not the moment in your room mm -hmm. uh, hours earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's a lesson I've never forgotten. and it's sustains me to this day. Yeah, I want to uh, come in on one other thing. You know, some people believe that the piano duets that you've done with mm -hmm. Chick basically took pianistic virtuosity in terms of improvisation to its zenith. And some people said it hasn't gone past that since. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk to us about, the, you know, the two of you like spurring each other on, learning from each other, uh, just, just like I said, just the virtuosity of the language, you know. And yeah, we, Chick and I, um, I should tell you about when we first got together to do the first um, tour. You know, when we first got together to rehearse, um, neither one of us had done anything quite like that before. He had done some duets, I guess, with his, his. Uh, well, his then girlfriend, now wife, uh, Gail, Gail Moran, uh, who was working in his band, and she's also a singer. But that was sort of a different, different um, story because um, um, she hadn't had the same kinds of experiences. You know, she was um, she wasn't like a heavyweight piano player per se, and that wasn't what she was about. Um, Anyway, um, he, Chick had two pianos in his house and two big Steinways, I guess they were, maybe a Bersendorfer and a Steinway concert grand, and concert grants, and, um, which was fortunate. That would, we didn't have to pay for a rehearsal studio. <laughs> and we didn't have to rent pianos. You know, it was great. And then we could just take our time and just feel really relaxed. Um, but I was a little nervous about it, and Chick was a little nervous about it too, uh, because we didn't. We both really respected each other. You know, we're both contemporaries, and, and so we decided to take a tune. I don't remember which tune it was, um, but we were both so cautious in the beginning. But I, it was funny to notice that that became easy. So then we would each start to take a few more chances, and that became uh -huh. easy. Uh -huh. And then, then we start being less and less polite, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, and uh, you know because at first we were so polite, you know, uh -huh. I would play something and I would wait to hear what Chick was going to play and really try to follow him, you know, and leave him a lot of space and he'd leave me space. It got to the point where we didn't have to leave each other any space. We could just both play simultaneously and it didn't even conflict. Uh huh. So we said, well. Looks like this is going to be a lot easier than we thought. It just happens that Chick and I just really fit each other. Somehow, it just works. It's amazing, you know? It's really amazing. I've, I've had the great fortune also to play uh, five concerts um, opposite Oscar Peterson, but we played uh, a couple of things together. So, I mean, that was a great opportunity for me. He's one of the people that that was a major influence on me when I was coming up. That's a little more difficult playing with Oscar. Maybe because he has been his own man for so long, he's used to doing certain kinds of things, and this is a pretty far removed from what he's accustomed to. Um, but still, we were able to find a common ground and, and, uh, um, and get something going. You know? I'll, but with I'll Chick, it's, like, it's, it's effortless. I don't even have to think about him being, uh, 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 about providing a space for him, you know. So it's, it's, it was really fantastic. And, and you're right, we would feed each other mm -hmm. constantly, you know. Uh, I've got some stories I could tell you about some funny concerts. 
one time uh, during the tour, it became so easy to play together that we started trying to find other devices to to use to kind of um, uh, just a combination of either like throwing a monkey wrench into the works just to just to uh, um, give us something to to deal with just know? to make a save yeah just, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and um, so we started getting into playing inside the piano you know <laughs> doing things like that combination of the two and different effects and then hitting then we started hitting the sounding board and hitting the the uh, uh, metal part, the harp of the piano, uh -huh. using that for rhythm. And I remember one concert, I think it was in <laughs> Hamburg. Uh, we played the concert, and the next morning, the newspaper comes out, and there's a picture of Chick and I. Chick was in the piano, <laughs> knees and everything. I mean, he had crawled craw into the piano. I was under the piano, <laughs> under the piano, on my back, banging on the sounding board, and we were actually, it, 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 things would just go that far. We were making music with, with rhythm, using other parts of the piano. I mean, it was, it was amazing. We would use physical gestures sometimes, you know, we'd get into where we were playing things and I'd do this. And then he would do this, or then he would do this. <laughs> and then there were eye movements, you know, up and down, and, you know. And, and that became part of it, you know, different, different things. And then, you know, we play. And then he would do, and, but we would make it as though it were, were uh, m music. Uh -huh. uh, we'd make some kind of pattern or organized patterns out of it. And um, integrate that, the, those kind of body movements with, with the notes that we were playing. And uh, it, it made some sense. Um, once we played at the um, Montreux Jazz Festival, and um, this was incredible. We got so many standing ovations. It was amazing. Um, it got to the point where by the, by the the fourth or fifth standing ovation, we decided not to even go to the pianos. So I took a, a chair, set it down in the middle of the stage. Chick sat in the chair, and I sat next to him. And we, for the last final encore, we never even touched the pianos. We were m making sounds with our mouth, you know, and doing things with gestures and I, all kinds of of things, and the people went crazy. They loved it <laughs> and because we had kind of gotten them to that. They were along for the trip, uh -huh. you know, and uh, it, it it really worked. It was a great great thing to experience for, for me, you know. And uh, we wound up actually doing two tours. One was in '76. I think the other one was in 1978. We had a great, great time together. Then we did a, we actually did a short tour in Brazil. I've forgotten um, what year that was. Uh, Brazil and some other parts of South America in the 80s. I got one final question, because I realized we got to let you go, because you got to perform tonight. Right. Just talk to us a little bit. Feedback, concepts, insights on you're being one of the icons and one of the spearheads of the whole electronic revolution. And it's, and it's the, the ways and types that either bonds with jazz or dissects jazz or is jazz. Mm. Um, I've, I started play, playing piano when I was seven. Well, when I was five, I was already building model boats and planes and taking apart things like watches. and I was always curious about how things worked. I'm the same way with people. I, people fascinate me. I'm always, you know, asking them, you know, questions and trying to find out what makes them tick. <laughs> and um, so I've always had this kind of interest in science. As a matter of fact, 
when I was in college, my first major was um, um, electrical engineering before I switched to uh, music composition. And uh, so when synthesizers came along, it um, fulfilled something for my life that I never dreamed would be possible. And that is to combine science and music in some kind of way. Mm. Um, so I naturally gravitated t toward that because I've always been interested in technology. And um, I've, I've always been interested in, in, in orchestration too. So, so a synthesizer to me is a tool for making instruments. It doesn't have any sound until you program something into it. You know, that's, so it's like the hammer and the nails, mm -hmm. you know, and the wood. And you have to have that, and then you can make an instrument. And so I can use it as a, a kind of a, 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 an or orchestration tool. Um, but then, since then, there have been other technologies involving computers and sequencing, and, and um, MIDI came along. And MIDI uh, is a way for, um, I, I know, this is funny because I was around with the fooling with electronics and, and music before MIDI came along. MIDI means Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, what I noticed that if I have an album I think it's the Sunlight album. On the back of this album, it's all of these keyboards, <laughs> full of keyboards. And there's no way I can get around to all those keyboards. So I remember telling instrument manufacturers, why don't you guys figure out a way to get these instruments to talk to each other so that, I mean, you, a person only has two hands, and I, I, wanna, I can hear that I'd like this to happen and that to happen, but I can't get to them all. But if you could get away figure out an electronic way for the instruments to talk to each other. Then I could play one instrument and it could actually trigger the sounds on other instruments. So that, anyway, that, I guess enough people started talking about that, they, they took it seriously and they actually formed an alliance which allowed them to make certain standards and make a protocol called MIDI. Yep. And uh, that led to some other ideas that we never even thought of, that you could start making keyboards that didn't have keys just modules, hmm. you know? And, uh, well, then I call them keyboards. Sometimes I, sometimes I do. I'll still call it a keyboard, even though it doesn't have keys, you know? Um, but um, I've got a rack with about, it has other things in it too, but it's got about five or six different, um, like keyboards, modular instruments uh, that can be talked to from another single keyboard. And it gives me the opportunity to, uh, to, um, like I said, arrange. And also sequencers, um, which came out of music and computer technology, um, give me a chance to, maybe I should explain what that is. Um, Rupert. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That's, okay. So this sequencer listens, sequencer remembers the notes that I play. And, and it, it's stored in the computer and then it can play back those same, um, the same code that contains the, the notes and uh, play it back through the instruments so that um, I can listen back to what I played, you know, on the very instrument that I played it on, you know, so the computer plays it the second time if I put it in a playback mode. And now we can have different tracks. Um, uh, now they have multi-track recording on your computer. Tapeless recording, you know, where the instrument gets put into uh, a hard, your hard disk. Uh, and so this has opened up all kinds of new possibilities for uh, recording in your home. I mean, all these parallels are happening also in business, in the business world too, you know. A lot of people are now able to work at home and, and have computer terminals at home and uh, have them um, connected through a modem uh, or other device to the uh, office machines. And so it just kind of expands this idea of virtual office. You know, same thing, it's like a virtual studio, you know. Um,
Now that's, uh, that idea of virtual studio is really um, taking shape because now it's possible, although this technology is very new, to be able to overdub on a recording and not be in the, in the, the city uh, that's recording it. It's remote recording where um, you can have a recording session in New York. <coughs> Excuse me. Musicians can lay down certain tracks. And if, say, they wanted me to overdub a part on that recording, uh, on a different track, I can be in Los Angeles, listen to the tracks that's, that have been recorded on um, and, uh, through a high-speed uh, telephone uh, linkage and record from my studio through, back through the phone onto the tape that's in New York. Wow. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have a setup in my studio now that allows me to do something like that. Uh, it just got set up just before I came to... No, it's not even set up yet. It was brought to the studio before I came to New York. You know, so I haven't had a chance to use it there. We did use um, the same device, actually, um, last night at the Blue Note. Um, Dolby has this device called Dolby Fax Pro, and, and it allows you to um, send um, music, high quality um, sound, uh, down a telephone line. That's a higher speed line than the regular telephone line. It's called an ISDN line. Um, but it's not very expensive, those ISDN lines. And they allow you to really um, uh, go more than, than uh, put more than your, big, your toe into the, the world of, uh, the new world of uh, technology, into the, uh, start getting into the uh, information highway. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. By the way, I should tell you that um, I'm launching a foundation. Tell us about that. And the idea of the foundation, uh, the overview pertains to technology for humanity. Because I've noticed that um, the, the the world of technology is going through the roof. It's amazing the things that are possible and the importance that technology is going to play in education, in um, uh, entertainment, and they coined this word edutainment. <laughs> you know, it makes education fun, you know. And um, uh, communications, and, and also in the workplace um, for, for business, teleconferencing, um, uh, for home entertainment, television, telephone. I mean, all these things are going to be all really linked up together in the very near future. Um, what we foundation when I called? look at I'm sorry? What, what, what will it be called? The foundation is called the Rhythm of Life Foundation. <sighs> and I, I look at programs like CNN and other news programs, and I see what's happening to humanity. And uh, humanity's in pretty bad shape. You know? And so I'm thinking, something's wrong with this picture. If the measure of the value of something I mean, isn't it supposed to be uh, what it does for humanity? Should be that anyway. Then what is technology doing for humanity? If humanity is in the toilet and technology is going through the roof. So there is something wrong with that picture. So um, I think there needs to be a, a lot more balance between the typical approach to technology, which is to look at machines first mm -hmm. and figure out what kind of tools can we make from these machines then take those tools to human being and say, how can you use these? And the human being says, oh, I can use it for this or for that. Meanwhile, the real issues that are the real problems for human beings, which have to do with the fact that uh, responsibility, which is something that's uh, part of the fiber of life, you know, uh, that's almost totally lacking in, in society today, you know. And uh, across the board, with the adults and with 
with uh, our young people. Uh, sense of responsibility and uh, things like courage, self-worth, mm. mutual respect, uh, uh, you name it. It's, I mean, uh, so many of these things need to be uh, nurtured, need to be encouraged, and um, um, even the decision-making process. You know, um, th this idea of having a very short view of life needs to be re-examine and change so we have a much longer view so we can s have a sense of the results of what the results of our actions can lead to you know promoting that kind of uh, follow-through and thinking about your life um, so anyway what this t uh, our foundation uh, wants to do is to propose that the that the technical uh, technological community spend at least some kind of balance of time looking at humanity first and mm -hmm. saying, how can I use technology to address the needs of humanity mm. and develop software and ideas from that standpoint? And, 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 and I can also see how your music would be at, at the spearhead of that. Listen, we've got to let mm. you go because you've got to play tonight. Right. This has been wonderful. Uh, Monk, am I, can I, can I, put a plug in here and say, could we do round two sometime? Because <laughs> he's not even started. He's not even warmed up yet. <laughs> but we're filming for Hamilton College Jazz Archives. We have been with one of the icons of this country in music, Herbie Hancock. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>